first day of school. Who's excited? a lot of you are going to change what you're going to do three or four or six times. But someday my dream was I might go to University of Chicago and get my MBA in finance. I walk in, sit down, and they introduce me to the gentleman at the next cubicle. His name is Sergio Karachi. Sergio was born in Japan, had just finished studying at University of Chicago. He had his MBA. Okay. Now, by the way, when you start a PNG brand management, they tell you that only three out of 10 will make it from brand assistant to brand manager. So he was gonna be my associate and colleague, but make no mistake, Sericia was also my competition. Next time I meet my boss. Her name is Lynn Fair. Lynn was very Southern, about five foot tall, 100 pounds. She shook my hand, she almost crushed it. She was one of the toughest people I've ever met. She invites me in. It is immediately clear that she's all business. Lynn went to Yale. OK. Yale, Miami, kind of similar. Public Ivy, right? Sure. <laughs> so I walk out to my desk, and there's a desk behind it. Nobody's there yet, but there are three big signs on the wall. <clears throat> One says in block letters, strike early, strike deep, strike often. Second one says, wear it out, use it up, eat it all. And the other one in very large letters says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Long before Kelly Clarkson decided that would be a great song. So I'm thinking, who sits at this desk? Okay, about a minute later, around the corner comes a gentleman named Daryl Mobley. He's six foot seven, 
wears a bow tie, heavy starch shirt. I found out from other people shortly after that, he'd been selected to two Olympic teams, had done covert operations for the military, and one of was Ebony Magazine's, one of their top eligible, sorry, top 100 most eligible bachelors in the world. These are my associates. I walked back to my desk and thought, this is a, a terrible mistake that's been made here. What, what, am, what am I doing here? How can I compete with these people? This is crazy. So I spent most of the next hour staring at the wall in front of me, terrified. But right about then, when things couldn't get any worse, a woman walks around the corner, and they say, oh, come on over. We'd like to meet, you to meet another new hire who started today. Her name is Helen. She introduces herself. She says, where did you study? When someone says, where did you study? you know they're coming with something strong. I say Miami, she says Harvard. Okay, now I just want to pack up my bags and go home. I mean, this is, this is terrible. How long am I gonna last in this job? A month, a week, a day, I don't know. Well, fortunately, five minutes later, a gentleman I met in the recruiting process, a guy who was also a Miami grad, came up, so I looked a little distressed, and he said, maybe we should go for a walk. I said, maybe we should, that would be a good thing. And of course, I said, Jim, this is crazy. I mean, why am I here? This, this isn't going to work. I said, you're fine. The recruiting process is very comprehensive. They know Miami very well. And they know, they know the kind of results that people from Miami have achieved here at Procter & Gamble. They don't make mistakes in the recruiting process. If you're here, you can do this. And he said, by the way, instead of you being intimidated by them, let them be intimidated by you. They have student loan payments the size of house payments. A lot of them have MBAs. You got their job coming from a public school in Ohio. They ought to be scared of you. Made sense. I was OK. Went back to my desk, got to work. In three to five years, if you do a great job, you get promoted to brand manager. In two years and 11 months, I was promoted first in my class of 100, including the Harvard kids, including the Yale kids, the Princeton kids, the Notre Dame kids, the Duke kids, first amongst all of them, the brand manager. Now, the story probably is most meaningful if I can go backwards eight years. My name is Patrick Sean O'Brien. I was born in South Bend, Indiana. My grandfather went to Notre Dame. My older brother went to Notre Dame. My older sister went to Notre Dame. I didn't get into Notre Dame. Tough day at my house. Um, really tough day. And, and the reality is, looking back on it, I didn't deserve to get into Notre Dame. I hadn't made good enough choices in high school to open that door. So when I went to college, I said, I'm going to start early. I'm going to figure this out. And I'm picking my job when I walk out of Miami. I don't know what I want to do yet. I have no idea. But when I'm a senior, I want to be able to look at a job and say, that one. And be able to get it based on the track record I built. And that's what I did. And I tell both pieces of that story. Because the reality is, it's not where you start, it's where you finish, right? You hear the PNG story and you go, yeah, this kid's probably like 36 on the ACT, straight A's in high school, this, that. No, none of that. I was somebody who got kicked in the teeth and decided to respond to it. That's simple. Now, if you walk out of here with one takeaway tonight, one thing and one thing only make it this. The education you can get at this school will put you in a position to compete with anyone, anywhere in the world, and to win. This school is fantastic. We're going to talk up tonight about what you can do to make the most of it. But I can tell you, based on not just my experience, but I've taught here now for 10 years, I'm in touch with probably one out of four of the students who I've ever had in my class. And the things they're doing 
will blow your mind. I mean, one of my students, I just went to her wedding in New York this summer. She left here, went to work for Deloitte doing consulting, got into Harvard Business School, went to Harvard Business School, became president of Harvard Business School, and at age 27 is now running global projects for Deloitte. She's a Miami grad. I went to the wedding, I met 15 or 20 other people just like her in a broad spectrum of fields, you know, just all doing really amazing stuff. So I truly believe, and I know it because I see it in the students who take my class, that the education that you can get here is truly outstanding if you make the most of it, if you make the right choices. Choices is a word you'll hear me say a lot tonight. Huge believer in this. Huge believer in the fact that if you had the credentials to get into this school, that if you make the right choices, you can leave doing whatever you want to do. You made a great choice coming tonight. I mean, my commitment and when I stand in front of any group like this is, I want you to leave here fired up. I want you very excited. And more importantly, I want you to have a plan. A lot of times somebody motivates you and a speaker comes in and you walk out and you're all charged up. And then the next day you're like, I was really excited, but now I don't quite know what to do. My goal tonight is that when you walk out of here, if you want to be as successful as you can possibly be at Miami, that you've got a winning game plan to get you from point A, where you sit today, to point B, wherever it is that you want to go. Acknowledging the fact, and this is my favorite thing about what I'm going to share tonight, you don't even have to know where that is. You can change your major once, you can change your major twice, but if you're making the right decisions, taking the right steps along the way, you're going to be a highly marketable candidate in any field. Or you can be like me and call your parents and say, hey, I know I studied this for four years, but I'm going to go do that because I think I can leverage the skills I've learned. And I go, but didn't you go study this for four years? And you go, I did. But I really believe that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and that with the background and training I have, I can do it really well. So tonight, I'm going to share some choices. First thing it's important for you to know is you're, it's a clean slate. I don't care if you were a valedictorian, salutatorian. I don't care if you got in here on the skin of your teeth. It doesn't matter. Clean, step, clean slate started today. It's what you do going forward that matters. Now, importantly, and, and this is really important, there are a lot of great reasons to be here. You've had a full week of orientation. Um, you know, you're, you're going to hear different speakers, you're going to hear from different professors when you go to your classes for the first time. The view of college that I'm going to give you tonight is my view. And the reality is this. When you walk out of here as a Miami grad, you're either going to have a great job, a good job, or no job. I see it every year. That's reality. The frame of reference I will speak from tonight is jobs. We could talk about becoming lifetime learners. We could talk the about the value of broadening and, and the Miami plan and all kinds of really phenomenal things that this school does. But tonight, the advantage you're going to have relative to your classmates who aren't here is you're going to have a much better perspective on how to land in the top tier, regardless of your major, regardless of the school you're studying in. So that's the frame of reference. I'm going to come back to that again and again and again tonight. Because when we leave here, what you're going to understand is you can make choices to get there. You won't like all of them, but where do you want to be? So, I'm going to ask you eight questions. 
So I could sit up here and give you every bit of knowledge I have that I've accumulated in 25 years of researching for three books, of seeing 10 years of graduates, of all the writing I do for USA Today, for the stuff I've done, I've interviewed uh, top recruiters, I mean, you name it, from huge companies, world leaders in healthcare, to the Googles and the Intels and technology, to people in, in you know, consumer packaged goods, just an incredibly broad range of, of companies that do an incredibly broad range of things. But eight questions is what we're gonna focus on tonight. And I think you already know the answers to most of them. We're gonna start simple, okay? If you wanna be successful in college, do you need to put in more time than you put in in high school or less? More, you're a, you're a quick group. <laughs> All right, so you're thinking, that was a pretty dumb question. Well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Let's talk about it for a second. In high school, what time did you typically get up and roll out of the house in the morning? 6.30? We'll even call it 7. What time did you get home? Okay, 6. If you, if you were in theater or played sports or you know, had something going after school, it might be 6, 7. We'll just assume you went straight home and you got home by 4. Okay, that's nine hours a day. Times five, nine times five. I know I'm at Miami. Great math. All right, 45. How many hours are you taking this semester? 17. How many are you taking in the green shirt? 15. All right, on average, you need 16 hours a semester to graduate in four years, which is my wish for you, and even more so your parents' wish for you, right? Okay, so, math's getting harder. 45 minus 16, 29, all right? Let's say I'm a good guy, and I am, right? I have a couple of my former students here, pretty good guy, right? So I'm gonna give you an hour a day for lunch. A little time to relax, let off a little steam. 29 minus five, 24. I will tell you right now, if you put in 24 hours a week studying, you will pick your job. It's over. You win. 24 hours a week. The reality is, is on average, college students nationally put in about 12. So on average, college students put in 12 fewer hours. When just a second ago, every single person kind of rolled their eyes and went, more. Of course you gotta put in more. Well, college kids don't. But you can. Get up early, budget your time, right? In the book I talk about a guy in my dorm, I lived in Stanton. Um, we, called him, we called him Spaceman. Spaceman went out every night. End of the first semester, they post the dean's list on the wall. His name is on it. Well, we couldn't believe, this has got to be a mistake. Well, apparently it's not. So immediately we want to know, what classes did you take? Who are your profs, right? Because we all want those teachers. Because clearly they just give an A to everybody. And he said, you guys don't get it. They go, well, clearly we don't. Could you care to enlighten us? And he said, I go out a lot, but for me, college is my full-time job. I'm up every morning by 7. I'm out of here by 7.30. And if you hadn't noticed, you don't see me hanging out during the day. I'm back home at 5.30. My nights, my weekends, they're mine. But I put in more time than any of you people do. And that's why I'm on the Dean's List. And he was right. So, number one, manage your time. It, it, it's simple, but, but it's, it's incredibly, incredibly important. Number two, if I'm a professor, and my name is Pat O'Brien, which actually both of those are true, and I'm teaching a, a standard course, and I'll talk a little bit about my course later. Um, I'm teaching a standard course, and on the spine of my book, it says, the book that I'm teaching from, it says Mary Williamson. 
is spending the night before the test trying to catch up on your readings, you know, reading eight, ten chapters. Is that a way to prepare for success on my test? No. Not even close. But you'll watch people do it. Okay? The reality is many professors don't even pick their textbooks. A department head may pick it. In some of the bigger classes that you'll take as freshmen, sophomores, they want consistency across the department. The reason people go into education is that they have a passion for something. Right? So let's say I'm a psychology professor. I'm passionate about psychology. I love it. So when you come in every day, I'm excited to teach you what I know about psychology. So when I test you, what do you think I'm going to test on? What's in the book or what I think is really important so we talked about? What we talked about. Right? So very simple. One, go to class no matter what. Period. Go to class. Number two, when you go, sit up front. I could be the most boring man in America. You can't fall asleep on me. You just can't. Okay? The dude back there who's nodding off, he can. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> we were talking about you. All right. So if you sit up front, you can't do that, right? If you sit in the back, it's easy to fade out. And, and as good a school as this is, you're not going to love every professor you have, and you're not going to be intellectually stimulated by every class that you take. There may be a Tuesday in a class that you go, I'm just not that interested in this. But if you're up front, you're in the game. Also, take a lot of notes. I might be so passionate about something I'm teaching you that day that I may say, you'd be well served to remember this. You may see this again. When I do that, I'm not trying to trick you. I feel so important that you learn this subject matter that I just shared with you that I'm basically going to give away to you the fact that it's on the test. When professors do that, most people just stare right back at them. You go, like, you ought to be starring it, putting circles around it. Like, that's 10 points in your next test, right there. Why would you not take those points? Okay, so number two, go to class and engage when you get there. Number three, this is where I start to lose friends. How many hours is a reasonable amount of time to study for a college level test? How many hours is a reasonable amount of time to study for a college level test? You in the red shirt, how many? Be honest. Like how many chapters? Well, just a typical test. Like five, About five, okay. Um, in the white Miami shirt? Six. Six. All right, in the gray shirt? That's you. Eight. Okay, and you? Ten. Ten. <laughs> what would you tell them, O seniors in the back there? For one test? See, I wouldn't even say that. They're taking hard classes, they're seniors. Give me 15 to start. As you get into 300, 400 level classes, it'll take more than that. Yeah, and I'm really serious about 15. But if you give me the 24 hours a week that I think you committed to about five minutes ago, you can fit that in, you can do that. And I'll even make you a deal. Remember, we said I was a nice guy, right? If halfway through the semester your grades are too high, you can back off to 10. And second semester, if you get at least, we'll call it a 3.8, we can back off to the five or six that you guys were talking about. And I'd, I'd be okay with that. But by the way, by the time you reach that point and you've got great grades and, and the people around you all like, you know, crashed and burned first semester because that's what all freshmen do, right? No. Start strong. Put in the time, put in 15 hours per test. And if you do it, right, let's use the spaceman story. Before class, between class, after class, before dinner. I'm not telling you 
not to have fun at college. I spoke at a school last week and some kid came up to me afterwards, he goes, I, I gotta ask you, did, uh, did you party in college? I said, I had a great time in college. I went out most Thursday nights, every Friday night, and every Saturday night. Now, I studied like an idiot all day on Sunday, and I put in, you know, dawn to dusk and beyond, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, never went out before a test. But, but the night before a test, there, there will always be in college the greatest party ever. It just happens, right? It is the greatest party ever, you must go. And then, you know, the people who go to the party went, yeah, it was okay. Uh, they get destroyed on the test. And then the next night, by the way, when there's no test, there's the greatest party ever again. And then you can just go to that one, and your friend's all bummed out because he or she bombed the test. Uh, but they get to go to that party, too. Um, so, 12 to 15 hours. Remember, we're going to put in more time than we did in high school, and if you look at all the free time you have, you actually do have time to do that. Number four, question's getting harder now. How many days in finals week? Five. Anybody have a different answer? I would argue, I would argue, what's that? No, I, I would argue 12. I would argue that the pace that you will create and have to maintain during finals week that you probably couldn't keep up for the whole semester. But, but, but I would say this, okay? Like by the time you're a junior or senior, if you're like a top of the heap kid, you will shut down all life as you know it seven days before finals start. You won't go out, you won't do, you won't do social stuff, you won't do the, you know, on, on Tuesdays we go to Chipotle and, and hang out for an hour, no. Upperclassmen have figured out that you stop a full week beforehand and you go at it hard. Now, why? Well, in a period of five days, 30 to 40 percent of your final grade will be determined. Think about that. You're going to come here the whole semester and work your tails off, I hope. And then in a five day window, 30 to 40 percent of your grade. A lot of the tests will be cumulative. So they're harder tests, and they're coming at you, one a day. Maybe you have two on Tuesday. Maybe you have a day off to catch your breath. But kind of an odd sequence and scheduling of tests, 30 to 40% of your grade. If you start a week beforehand, and you say, OK, let me start with my last test. It's cumulative, it's not cumulative. If it's not cumulative, maybe you get away with the 15 hours. If it is cumulative, it's probably going to be more. So when can I do that study? Then you go, when's my second to last test? And start to schedule that. And then you go backwards. And by the way, you'll find that to study as much as you want to study and still sleep, and we'll talk about that, that you'll need seven days ahead of time. But I promise you, freshmen get A's. Right? Freshmen get four points. Freshmen get three fives. Not everybody hits the wall freshman year. So, so why not you? Why, why not you be one of the freshmen who gets the strong grades? The stuff that we've talked about doing, none of it's rocket science. What I've just shared is basic blocking and tackling. Simple stuff, very doable stuff. Like these two who are in my class, by the way, to get into my class, you have to send me, to a, re you have to send me a resume, you have to have a certain GPA, and you have to be a campus leader. I have kind of an odd class. Um, but it's meant for the top of the top of the juniors and seniors at Miami. They're both in that class, right? They made the choices. You can make the choices. They were you 36 months ago. Now, you may be sitting there going, I don't want to work that hard. My response is, you don't have to. You absolutely positively don't have to work that hard. unless you want to be on the top shelf. If you want to pick your job, if you want to create your opportunity, then I would say, all in all, it's a, it's a pretty manageable investment. 
and you get where you want to go. And you fully leverage the amazing opportunities this school has. By the way, I would even comment on this. I can talk to a student. If I sat with, um, if I sat with any of you after the end of your sophomore year, right? So what is that? 19 months from now? No, 21 months from now? I could tell you with a pretty good degree of certainty how the story is going to end. Like in the first two years, you will set a trajectory for your college career, whether you change majors or not, whether you even know what you want to do yet or not. But after two years, I could look at it and go, she's in phenomenal shape. She's really going to do amazing things. Or I could say, well, this other person, they're they're going to have kind of a rude awakening in a year or two. So it's really even like the first two years. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that and explain that point later. Uh, so that was question four. Question five, which might help you understand the importance of questions one through four. This is the bonus question tonight. Anybody gets this question right, except the seniors. I'll buy you La Rosa's pizza. That's, that's the kind of Cincinnati Oxford pizza if you're not from Ohio. It's OK. Uh, um, what's an ATS? What is an ATS, and how will it either empower your job search or cripple it in 36 months? Because it's a big deal. No, you're not allowed to look in the book, <laughs> but I like the creativity. All right. So. When I ran a division for Monster.com, we sold things called ATSs. And ATS was an applicant tracking system. And let's break it down and make it very simple and help you understand how, how that's relevant to your life. Okay? So let's say the woman in the blue back there, you want to apply to company A. Okay? Let's say you're a recruiter for company A. Okay, she applies, she's one of 160 Miami kids who wants to get on the recruitment schedule that day. Okay, you're coming to recruit, in fact, she's coming with you. And when you recruit, it's typically a half an hour interview, eight slots a day, so, or eight slots in the morning, eight slots in the afternoon, so 16. So you have 32 slots, you have 160 students that you have to sift through to figure out who gets the 32 spots. But you bought an applicant tracking system, as every medium sized and big size, large company has. So all these students are now in a database. They have resumes, but what you have is a sortable database with every field available to you. If it's 4.45 in the afternoon, you want to go running after work, you got stuff to do, you're a busy guy, and you've got to get down. You don't really want to look at 160 of these profiles. Maybe you'll look at 50. What would you sort on? What field would you sort on that would determine whether or not she got an interview? What's the first thing you're going to sort on? GPA. Is that right? Oh, I don't know, but it's real. Now, you're probably not going to set it at 3.9 because good recruiters do understand the concept that they want well-rounded students who've done things on campus and didn't just go park themselves in the library 24-7. So you, you know, depending on the company, you might set it at 3.2, you might set it at 3.5, good economy, bad economy, but you're going to sort on GPA. So if she's got a 2.4, but has done all this amazing stuff on campus, you're never even going to see her, her resume, are you? Nope. And you're going to find 32 candidates. And I'm here to tell you that Miami of Ohio, most of those candidates will be darn good. You're going to hire a bunch of those students. And off you go, happy as can be. And she's going to be sitting that back there going, but, but, but wait. I, uh, uh, on the other hand, if she's got a 3.6, she takes the first step. She starts the interview process. She's in. So as I've harped on the time you're going to put into academics, 
how you're going to approach time management, how you're going to approach finals week, I believe it's more important than ever. It's more important than when I was at Miami because of the technology that employers are going to use to screen you in or to screen you out. All right, but very important, question six, and I'll explain why that GPA only gets you that first step. It only gets you that interview. I don't want you to just get the interview. I want you to get the job. And I want more, more Miami students to get jobs than students from other schools. So how are we going to take that next step? Question. Do recruiters care if you held office in organizations here on campus? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says maybe? I say maybe. All right, in high school, every, you all had some kind of activity sheet. So it's nice to have all the titles. And I think the titles are nice too. But what I care more about is impact. Was she an impact player? Was he an impact player? What do I mean by that? Well, two words, different, better. Okay, different, better. Did you make things you were a part of somehow different and better? You may be president of Alpha 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 or this, that's great. You may be a member of 16 scholastic honorers. You've got more Greek letters on your resume than any other three people on campus. I don't really care. How did you make a difference, right? Uh, one of the students I had graduated about four years ago was incredibly sought after by employers. Her name was Brittany and her passion was horses. And Miami's equestrian club was really struggling when she came in. And she looked at it and said, I love horses. I don't want this to die. Miami's had an equestrian club forever, but membership's down, financial support's down, and it's, I, I can see where it's going. And she said, she joined the club, and by the time she was a sophomore, she said, I want to I wanna, you know, revive this thing. And I'm going to do membership drives. We're going to do fundraisers, because if you know anything about equestrian, it's not cheap. I'm going to find a way to get alumni involved who had wonderful experiences with Equestrian Miami at Miami and help reacquaint them with them and, and revive that passion, see if they'll help us financially. And she rebuilt the Equestrian Club. Different, better, awesome. Employers looked at her and said, she's someone who can make a difference. I'm not hiring a 22-year-old because of your experience. You don't have a lot. I'm hiring you because you're hard charging and you've got fresh new ideas and you can get things done. We all know that person who has a million different ideas and can't get out of their own way. Are you a person who can get things done? So titles are nice. If you are president or on, you know, or vice president or treasurer of some student organization, it puts you in a position that it's easier to have an impact. But you can also just head a committee. Or, you know, you can't say, oh, I didn't get elected president, it's over for me. You can run a committee and have a big impact. You can start your own organization. There is so much you can do if you're willing to put yourself out there and try, but different or better. And, and my favorite thing about that is in college, if you try and you fail, you don't lose your job, nobody dies, you pick yourself up, you brush yourself off, and you try again. It's, it's a no-risk learning lab, right? I'm not, I'm not a natural born leader. I've never been a leader. Well, you're like 18. Why should anybody expect you to be a leader today? I'd like you to know a little bit more about leadership, to have a little more experience leading and guiding people and getting, getting them excited about ideas when you walk out of here. But to do that, you gotta put yourself out there and take some chances. 
Number seven, is it reasonable for a recruiter in three years from now, so you're a senior, is it reasonable for them to expect that you have relevant work experience in their field when they hire you? So you're 21, college kid, three years experience. Is it reasonable for them to say, yeah, but we really want to hire someone with experience? Who thinks that's reasonable? Who thinks it's kind of unreasonable? It doesn't matter if we think it's reasonable or not because it's real. They will expect it. Top shelf. So, how can you gain that experience between now and then? How can you leverage jobs and internships and, and put yourself in a position so that when you sit down with them your senior year, you have experience? It's doable. Miami kids do it every year. It's the ones who are proactive and go out and get it. Now, the career services brochure. Career services in general here, it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the career services department at Miami is a competitive advantage for you. But they're not gonna come knocking on your door every three weeks. You know, we haven't seen you yet. You need to engage, you need to go, you need to be proactive. Jobs on campus that have nothing, you know, you go, okay, sitting at the desk, you know, for the chemistry department for 12 hours a week. How is that going to help me? Well, it's going to help you a lot. You're going to meet the professors. You're going to develop relationships. If somebody comes in who's here who's, you know, recruiting from Ethicon and wants to come in and, and, and meet their old professor and just say hello, guess who's sitting at the front desk? You. So, and, and when I come to recruit for an internship, for an internship I know you don't have any experience. Right, but if I'm coming from Baxter Pharmaceuticals, I may look at, it, look at your resume and see that you work in the chemistry department. I go, oh, he's, he's pretty into this. Why, do you, why did you choose that? What do you like about working there? Suddenly we've got a good dialogue about something outside the classroom. I get an internship then the beginning of my senior year, I have that experience that they wanted. Suddenly not so daunting, right? Now, my wish for is that you have two internships. And if you can, do something as close to relevant as you can even next summer. Whatever kind of setting you think you want to work in, what can I do next summer beyond making ice cream cones at the local Whippy Dip that's a little more relevant? There's nothing wrong with the Whippy Dip. But <laughs> what can I do that's a little more relevant so that I learn a little bit more, I broaden a little more, but you've got to you know, keep your eyes and ears open, start talking to professors. Um, early and often, talk to, you know, your, your parents have friends that you've never had an adult conversation before in your life. They still think of you like you're nine. What do you do? Why do you like it? Let's talk about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But leverage all of the resources you have here at your disposal at Miami. Leverage the Career Center. Become, you know, become certified. It's a really good investment of your time, and I think one of the reasons you're here at this school and here tonight is you want to be there. Right? Right? So, related to that, question eight. We need honesty on this one. Who, now that you're in college, is really excited about the idea of networking? I think a lot of people who raise their hand on that are liars. A few people like it. But as I tell my class, so this is a, a, a short preview of one of the things we talk about in one of the classes, is I'd like to change how you think about networking. I think networking is really important. But most think, people think about networking as meeting people 
and seeing what I can get from them. So it feels insincere, it feels smarmy, it's uncomfortable. And under that definition, it should be uncomfortable. But let's think about it a little differently. Okay? What about investing in people? What about trying to find ways to make an investment with an investment in people that you meet that you'd like to have a relationship with? It's not that hard. You just have to think, you have to be creative. One of my favorite role model mentors was a guy named Stephen Covey. He wrote a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, probably one of the five most significant business books of all time. If you haven't heard of it, you'll have heard of it by the time you walk out of here. Okay? I met him at a conference. I was in a long line of about 100 people who all shook his hand, took his picture, and, and never spoke to him again in their whole lives. Okay? I'm in that line going, this guy is one of my heroes. What could I do to help him? Is there anything I can do for Stephen Covey? And I thought, you know, I've, I've heard his son is writing a book called Seven Habits for Highly Effective Teenagers. I've just written a book for teenagers. I did a lot of market research, and I'm an old P&G guy, so I think it was pretty good research as to how to write this book and what to say to make it work. So I got to the front of the line, I introduced myself, he got ready for the obligatory photo. I said, hi, my name is Patrick O'Brien. I'm an author of a book called Making College Count. I've done a lot of research on the teen audience. If your son, Sean, would like any help whatsoever in writing the book, if he'd like a free set of eyeballs, if he'd like someone to edit it, or even just someone to collaborate who's done writing for teens and does a lot of speaking to teens, I would do, I would do it for free as a way to say thank you for the impact you've had on my life. Here's my card. Got a call the next week. Was involved on the editorial team. Before the book was published, I said, hey, if it's of any merit, I'd be delighted to give you a quote for the book. I think it's outstanding. They said, we'd love a quote. And the quote from Patrick O'Brien, Making College Count, sits between the quote from Christy Yamaguchi, gold medalist, and Lou Holtz, national champion football coach. I went, that worked out pretty well. <laughs> Closer to home, I had a neighbor kid, Miami kid, by the way, cuts my grass. Yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, no, sir. Incredibly diligent, incredibly service-oriented, just sharp kid. Okay, it would always ask me questions about college and my career. And when he was at the beginning of his senior year, I was on the sideline of a soccer game. And I met a woman who I found out was a national recruiter for Cintas. And she said, we've almost filled our class for the year. We have two open spots. And I said, no, you don't. You have one. And she goes, well, what do you mean? I said, because you need to hire William Glazier. He's awesome. He's a senior at Miami. He's a phenomenal kid. He's done this, this, and this at Miami because he and I had talked. And he's the most customer service oriented guy I've ever met. And I love Cintas. Cintas is a great company. Um, does a ton of recruiting here at Miami and obviously is a big supporter, obviously. Uh, William, you know, she called William the next day. They interviewed within the week, and William is in his second year with Cintas in Chicago doing a phenomenal job and loving it. That's networking. Networking is meeting people, investing in them, and building real relationships. And if you think about it that way, you're going to be a whole lot more excited about going out and meeting people and networking. All right. Eight questions. Um, each of you can do all of those eight questions, all of those eight things we discussed, right? What, what did I talk about that you can't choose to do? Nothing as far as I know. Now, Here's where it gets interesting, and I'm going to be quick about this. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. But as you read the book, and I know you will, okay, this is the basic success model in the book. Okay? And it's a little different spin on the eight questions we just talked about, but let me explain it very quickly. Okay? There are three foundational parts of your college experience. There's what happens in the classroom, 
We talked a lot about that. You've got to get it done in the classroom. Second, extracurricular activities. Different or better, right? Got to be an impact player, got to make a difference. Third, the work experience. A lot of the things we talked about related to career services, right? Starting early, getting opportunities, even if they're not glamorous at first, put yourself out there, get the work experience. When you do those three things, you're going to build those skills. Okay? When I, rec when I interviewed recruiters from top companies in the world of all kinds, all industries, and said, what are you looking for in the college graduates you hire? They basically played back those seven things. And actually, now when I do the model, I put a halo around it with the word ethics. Because they care more than ever about your ethics, because people who've made poor choices have brought down some of the largest organizations in the world. So that matters today more than ever. But, but seven things, and they call them different things. They may call them core competency, core competencies, P&G calls them the what counts factors. They, they all change in different industries, but the reality is those are the seven things. And if you build them while you're here in college, and you'll naturally build them by doing those, those things, by, by being strong in academics, extracurriculars, and work experience, and then off you go. It's that simple. It's that clean. It's hard, but having researched it for 20 years, having a front row seat to it on this campus for 10, that's how it works. And the key is, so let's just for fun, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Why don't the eight of you come up here, we'll stand out. I won't embarrass you, you won't even have to talk, but I just want to show you how it's going to happen on interview day. Okay? So these eight, okay, they now know the seven core competencies. I call them the winning characteristics. They know what I want, so they are queued up to get this job. Okay? So they're all dressed well, they're all polished, they're all certified with the Career Center, and here we go. So we get in the interview, and I say, tell me about a time when you got other people excited about an idea and went out and made something happen that wouldn't have happened without you involved. I don't want to hear what you were president of. I don't want to hear what varsity team you played on. I want to know when you made an impact, when you made something happen that if anybody else was sitting in that seat wouldn't have happened. Oh. That's a tough question. Some people have an answer. And by the way, then I'll ask it again. I'll say, tell me about another time. And tell me about another time until I wear you out. Maybe four out of the eight, one, two, three, four, step forward, give me answers that I'm satisfied with. They've now shown me that they have leadership skills. Okay. Now I want to know what kind of medal you have. Tell me about a time, you four only, that you had too much on your plate. You're working, your school's coming down on you, you've got extra quick, you just had too much. <coughs> tell me about a time you had too much on your plate and tell me how you successfully managed it. Tell me what you did. Okay? Everybody's going to give me an answer. Not everybody's going to give me a good answer. What I'm trying to get at is, Who's motivated? Who's, who's going to put in the effort? Who's going to stay the extra hours? Who's going to do whatever it takes for us to get the job done? And not what you say you're going to do. I want to know what you have done. Okay? This is when you go to the Career Services Center, they're going to talk about behavioral based interviewing. And what it basically means is that I'm going to assume as a recruiter that what you do in the future will be similar to what you did in the past. And if these two tell me how they put in the hours, how they work not just hard, but work smart and prioritized, delegated, and figured out a way to get it all done and get it done well, go ahead and take a step forward. 
Now I know that they have two of the core competencies that are most critical to me. Right? So they all got in the game with their GPA. They got through my applicant tracking system. The stories they shared might have been about extracurricular activities. They might have been about work. They might have been about a church group or a hobby or it, community. It doesn't matter. Right? What matters is that you build these competencies. And by the way, this isn't a, you know, this isn't for one major or one company or even one school within Miami. This is broadly how recruiters think about recruiting students. So if you have no idea what you want to do yet, I look at that and say, that's OK. I want you to battle to try and figure it out. And by the way, if you think you're interested in you know, a particular field and you join a club, and that club has speakers come in, that's going to help you figure it out. You're going to take classes. Hopefully, you're going to get some work experience. I completely shifted gears after my junior year. Would I recommend that? Not necessarily. But I was far enough along, and I had a broad enough background, and I could answer those questions to get here that I was able to successfully navigate and get a job outside my career field. So you're not limited, gee, I am this major. Well, that, that shouldn't limit you, right? It should it just create opportunities for you if you've built the academics, the extracurriculars, and the work experience to get it done. OK, you guys can go ahead and sit down. Thank you. Now, I told you um, that I could talk to you in 24 months and tell you how the story will most likely play out for you. Let me, let me read an email I got literally a month ago from a student. <clears throat> I'm not going to share his name. Dear Mr. Brian, I reached out to you late last year thanking you for providing insights and ideas on how to be as successful as possible. I want to start by thanking you again, giving you a brief update on what I've been up to. I started college as an average or traditional student. After we, after I, we spoke, I continued to work hard, implemented your advice, and was able to get into the honors program in my school. I had the opportunity to spend two weeks in India, my first time out of the country, and even got elected as president of an organization. All of this culminated into an amazing job opportunity, an internship, um, at a company called Standard Textile. I'm doing an internal management consulting and corporate strategy internship, and I love it. I'm earning, learning so much every day, and I find it incredibly fascinating. I'm thinking about starting a new club related to all this at my school. In short, thank you for coming to speak to us. Da -da 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 -da. And at the bottom, below his name, it says class of 2016. This kid's a sophomore. I don't need another 12 months to figure out how the story ends for him. He's going to go do whatever he wants. Average student makes a commitment, makes great choices, doors begin to open. And once the doors begin to open, they seem to continue to open in front of you. If you get off to a fast start, it's, tr it's truly amazing the number of green lights that open up. And then you wake up in sophomore year and you find out like the most selective clubs in your major, like the best clubs in your major, a lot of them don't let everybody in. You've got to earn a spot. You've got to interview. You've got to show them that you're one of the top students in that major. GPA, extracurricular activities, what have you done work-wise? All choices that every person in this room can make or not. Again, what's your goal? I knew what mine was. And while I did have fun here at Miami, I had an incredible amount of fun. I knew where I wanted to be. What I hope I've given you tonight, and what I hope the book will offer you, is a roadmap to get you from where you sit today to wherever it is that you personally want to go, however you define success. 
which Miami students define success incredibly differently. And it's not for anybody else to define that for you. It's your career. It's your journey. But it starts with the choices. I'd like to leave you with uh, the message I got on the holiday card that I received from Daryl Mobley, the six foot seven inch guy with the bow tie who worked with me at P&G. His holiday greeting came. It was a picture of Santa Claus. I opened it up, and it was one simple question that he presented to me that I still think about literally three decades later. I still think about a question that he put in my holiday greeting card long, long ago. How great will you choose to be? How great will you choose to be? Because I believe, as strongly as I believe anything in my life, that with the educational possibilities you have at this school, everything, literally everything, including being president of this country, which Miami grads have been, including being congressmen, CEOs, making major medical breakthroughs, having huge impact on the lives of children. I mean, you, you can go across majors at this school, every school, every major, and people have reached the pinnacle of their profession. So how great will you choose to be? I'd like to leave you with that tonight. Uh, have a great week, have a great semester, uh, and a great career here at Miami. Uh, go Red Hawks. And by the way, um, I hope to see many of you in my class in 24 months. Uh, you will have to send me a resume. Uh, you will have to hit the hurdle rate on the GPA. Um, do I have my email address on there? I don't. Um, my email address is pat at makecollegecount.com. I have a Miami one too, but it's, it's longer and more difficult to articulate. Um, so it's pat at makecollegecount. And uh, I would love to see you in my class in, uh, in 24 months.